Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Saturday edition. Well, this week it's the Saturday edition, episode 569. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 25th of January, 2020. Okay, before we get started, if the audience needs to know, this is more of a casual unscripted, well, which is kind of the definition of unscripted. Well, listen, I just got back from D.C. It was a long drive. I'm tired. Uh, George has a bunch of services he has to do. Gavin's doing some projects. His wife gave him out at the at the uh, Chateau Villa, Villa out there in, in France. So we're, we're, we're trying to, to throw together a quick show for you guys uh, so you have something to, to watch and uh, be educated on what's going on in, in the Christian world because uh, there, there's a lot happening. Before we get too far, I need you guys to share the program with your friends and enemies. We need you to comment because when I upload this, the show doesn't end. These episodes never end because you keep commenting. And there was a comment 10 minutes ago on, on last week's episode. We appreciate that. We read the comments. We love the comments. Today, we're going to talk about a comment from like four or five episodes ago about the Anglican ordinariate. But I digress. The most important thing you can do if you got nothing better to do is click the like button. That tells YouTube and uh, Facebook that this is something important to you and to people like you and to people who like, 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 like you. So just click that like button. Something special to do. Should I talk about the bell? No, just subscribe. If you've not clicked the red rectangle yet, please subscribe to the program. It's important to you as well. Okay, gentlemen, a lot happened. I just got back from the Anglicans for Life. Uh, which is hosted by Georgette Forney, uh, fifth year in a row down in uh, uh, Falls Church. I got to see the News Falls Church Anglican building, which is an amazing church, uh, and had a lot of fun. So I'm tired. Let's talk about other news, and we'll get back to that. Uh, I saw we got a letter uh, from Bishop Love giving us an update, George. Can you give us a, a, a rundown on that? Yes, uh, Bishop Bill Love of Albany. His hearing uh, has been scheduled for April up in Albany on charges of violation, his or, violating his ordination vows. This arose because Bishop Love declined to enforce a resolution of general convention. And the formal notice of trial was, uh, it's not a trial, it's a hearing. The formal notice was put forward and in his letter to the diocese, Bishop Love says, there's not really any question of facts at dispute. Rather, each side is going to make the legal arguments as to whether or not a resolution is binding. In other words, what comes first in the priority of, of Anglican orders, the prayer book rubrics or the resolutions of general convention? Historically, prayer book rubrics are the final word. But the current powers that be want that be. Do you, you travel with your clocks, don't you, Gavin? You say, I'm gonna, I can't leave the clocks in England. I got to take them with me to France. <laughs> I'm just feeling like I can turn the microphone off and I should have done it instantly. I'm sorry. I, I, I have a couple of clocks here. It's true. Sorry, George. <laughs> I'll hit the microphone up next time. The, the issue is what comes first, rubrics or resolutions or the mind of general convention. And it comes down to the interpretation of where does authority lie? Does it lie in the general convention and its decisions of a moment? Does it lie in the prayer book? Does it lie in something deeper? And so this is going to be hearing and I assume that the decision will be appealed one way or another. and. What we have seen from a political standpoint is that the presiding bishop has slow walked this. Next general convention is next year. And I, unless there's some extraordinary development, I think this will still be sub judice by the time we get to the next general convention and the point will be viewed because there'll be new resolutions that'll undo the old ones. But, you know, it, worst case scenario, Bishop Love can find himself uh, out the door best case scenario he can find his uh position upheld as 
being in conformity with the Book of Common Prayer, that you cannot compel people to do something that is not contained in the rubrics of the Book of Common Prayer and the Constitution and Canons. I think the best case scenario here is the Anglican Diocese of Albany. That's got a good ring to it. Does it? Oh, that, that'd be, that would be the best case scenario is to uh, fall under the ACNA. But, you know, there's a lot of old buildings there, a lot of assets and properties and uh, a lot to fight for. And uh, there's a lot of people that want to stay within the Episcopal Church, despite how bad it really is uh, on the ground, including, you know. Well, it's also bad on the ground in the sense the diocese is not, not united. There is yeah. a vocal minority there that has been made Bishop Love's life difficult. So... I, I, though some may uh, wish and cheer on Bishop Love uh, in a certain direction, I don't think that's a very uh, likely outcome, simply because of New York case law so far would, would say that the buildings stay with the National Church. That's New York now, it's not, other states are different. And to be frank, those who've moved have moved. And also, and this is something that may not be of knowledge, that Bishop Love uh, doesn't have... D Bishop Love is a wonderful man, but he does not have the gift of building coalitions around him. He did not succeed in this work in the House of Bishops. And he's not really succeeded in the Diocese of Albany of people saying, my bishop right or wrong. So some bishops have a greater ability jack eicher for instance could or keith ackerman could unite people behind him both on doctrinal issues and strength of personality i don't this is not a criticism of bishop love but not everybody is like keith ackerman well but they all left as well there's nobody left to unite behind bishop love Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when uh, GAFCON for, or the ACNA formed, uh, they took uh, a lot of the conservative, uh, orthodox, motivated bishops with them and kind of left uh, Bishop Love in the lurch uh, with no support uh, well, well, internally in the Episcopal Church. Well, the communion partners bishops uh, are a decent group of guys, but they have put their whole hope and trust in Justin Welby. They come back saying that Welby will protect us, Welby will put pressure, Welby is our ally, Welby is our friend. Now, I don't, I'm not able or not willing to dissuade them of this because it's a cherished belief, but I think that's a rather foolish way of thinking of myself based on my observation and of history. I need to transition here to, to some news uh, from the Church of England which they, they issued a document. It is called the Church of England House of Bishops Pastoral Statement on Civil Partnerships. And I saw this in my email box. I said, oh, this is great. We're going to have wonderful fodder on how messed up this church is and just how much they've sunk into the liberal lies that have taken over Europe. And I, I start reading it, and I'm to paragraph 4, and I'm paragraph 8. Was this written by Gafcon? Let, let me go back and check the title. Church of England House of Bishops Statement. On, uh, it was an orthodox statement on uh, sexual ethics and teachings within the church. As orthodox as I would expect uh, from uh, politicians and bishops. And I'm like, well, clearly Gavin left too soon because... <laughs> The, this is what I would see in a Roman Catholic uh, teaching document. Uh, clearly, George uh, um, is going to have nothing to say about this because it makes common sense. There's, there's, no, there's no crazy here. We've read so many crazy things. We've heard so many crazy things from the Church of England over the last 18 years that uh, to see something normal is going to be big news. And this is the big news. They don't practice, not what they preach, they don't practice what they have written on documents. Justin Welby made a very keen observation when people were complaining that the Church of England is changing. He said, no, we didn't change the 39 articles. We didn't change any of the documents. We didn't change our prayer book. Nothing has changed. 
This document shows nothing has changed as well, George. Yes and no. Uh, on paper, nothing has changed, but pra pastoral practice is evolving. The pastoral statement on civil partnerships, there are wheels within wheels within wheels. And, we sh and I, who have been harshly critical of the Church of England's leadership, must now applaud them when they have done something right. This is a wonderful statement, thoroughly orthodox, that sexual relations are properly confined in male-female marriage not in partnerships, not in same-sex relationships, that the place of sex sexual expression is between husband and wife. Everything else falls short. This is a restatement of Lambeth 110 in, in different words. So, congratulations. Uh, they've taken, frankly, a courageous stand that has held them up to ridicule from The Guardian and from uh, polite society and has caused a Twitter storm on uh, social media against them. But as we discussed in the pre-show, there's a difference between uh, a public statement and the enforcement and discipline and reception of such a statement. And I think, Gavin, the point that you raised was that, well, it really doesn't matter what they say anymore. They've essentially shot their bolt of authority a long time ago, and it's hard to recoup that. I think it's a difference, George, between holiness and therapy. Um, so first of all, I agree with everything you said. Um, there are two issues here. One is that it's all about the civil partnerships is what has produced the document. And the fact is that a civil partnership is of no interest to the Church of England. Um, civil partnership mark one was the step which allowed gay people a, a platform to approach their desire to be married. And the Church of England was really pastorally if not creedily, very supportive about civil relationships, civil partnerships for gay people. Um, then people, the, the gay community stopped using civil partnerships because they could get married under secular law. So it, it disappeared and became something um, uh, antique. Except that some straight people have said, well, we'd like civil partnerships too. And they were told under the Equalities Act, you're not equal enough to have them. So they, they, which of course is part of the ludicrousness of the Equalities Act. So they pressed away and they went to the courts and they said, look, if equality really does mean equality, which it didn't, then you should give us the right to be civilly partnered. And the courts uh, decided this was logical and said, you can be civilly partnered. So then the Church of England had to make up its mind about what civil partnership for heterosexual couples meant. And they said, well, it's not marriage, so really we don't have a view on it. There isn't anything to say. It's a, it's this antique uh, episode which is only going to be used by a small minority of people. But to give them their great credit, they did use the opportunity to restate the Christian view that sex belongs inside opposite partnered married couples. However, why, sh why should I feel uneasy about that instead of giving them the credit they deserve? I think I feel uneasy for two reasons. First of all, because as you quite rightly said at the beginning, there's a huge gap between preaching and practice. So the practice within the Church of England is not to make any distinctions at all about sexual behavior. Nobody's ever asked about it. There's no practice of confession. You're, you're not barred from communion. You don't have to tell your clergyman. If you turn up as a lesbian or a gay couple or an unmarried couple of church, everyone applauds you and wants to make you feel welcome. So on the ground, what the bishops have said isn't carried out in any, in any observable sense. So why are they saying it? Um, maybe, they, maybe they mean it. That would be the nice thing to believe. Um, and the, our nice listeners will say, give them credit for meaning it. Our suspicious listeners will say, they're just not ready to make the jump that they're about to make because they will lose too many Orthodox members. Um, and I'm afraid I, I veer towards the suspicious point of view. Well, Gavin, last week we discussed a video put out uh, under the uh, headship of Christine Hardiman, the Bishop of Newcastle, uh, that eventually put forward the new ethic that you people holding on to the views espoused in the Bishop's pastoral statement are evil and cruel and and you need to get with the program and you need to be, march in step with society. So here we have one, we have a pastoral group in the Church of England promoting one thing and a week later we have a different statement 
doctrinally saying, no, 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 the pastoral people are are teaching false false doctrine. How do you square oh, thank that? Thank you, George. How do you square that? Well, no, thank you. Thank you very much. It can't be squared, but what you've done is you've given me absolution for being suspicious. I, the reason I'm suspicious is because, is because I saw this video and I went, yeah, that's what you're really about. That's what you're doing. You are, you are moving the church's um, praxis, I suppose is the best word, uh, to, towards the secular norm. But then this, this strange phenomenon of, of the, doing the splits, praxis moves ever in a secular direction, and the theological statement stays where it was. It's an odd thing to do. As you say, you, you can't explain it. it. A harsh critic would say it lacks integrity. A, a, um, a, a nice person would say it's covering all the bases for the sake of being nice to people. Or a, a third way forward would be for those who will honor it are going to honor it. Those who have no intention of honoring it will ignore it as they've ignored it, the doctrine and discipline for the past 40, 50 years. It's status quo restated. Well, it, yes, it's, which, which, uh, it's the position yeah. of the church, not the practice of the church. This is the position of the Church of England uh, on matters of same sex uh, relationships. This is not the practice of the Church of England on same-sex relationships. Well, I, I, so, or, 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 I would, it's not just same-sex. I mean, it's, it's also oh, yeah. straight people who are not married. Sure. Uh, it, it, yeah. I'll be pedantic and say that the defenders would say it's the position of the Church of England, but there are church members of the Church of England who don't practice this. So that one is an institutional statement that defines but then you have the phenomena of many, many, many people within that institution, including members of the House of Bishops, the Bishop of Buckingham, for instance, making, or Paul Bays of Liverpool, making uh, the opposite noises. So I don't, I, I, I think there's a, a semantic leap that I'm not willing to say of Church of England position, Church of England practice. I would say it's a Church of England position, but it's not universally practiced. And I'd like to go back to this distinction between therapy and holiness again, because um, I, I, it seems to me that, that the main role that um, the church leaders in the Church of England have is to act as, as therapeutic agencies to make people feel better about themselves. Um, so, so people have been using the therapeutic model for some time. And finally, the church has caught up and said, well, we should be doing this. But actually, it's, it's the church's role, I think, to give absolution question the Church of England has to ask is, is its main function to act as a conveyor, a mediator of holiness uh, and, and, and of absolution, or is it as a therapist to make people feel better about themselves? Um, and the reason I, well, it seems to me simply it's, it's moving, it's almost always doing the former. And, it, and this present document might suggest that it's doing the latter. If there were any sanctions, if there was any, if there was anyone anywhere in the Church of England that said, well, if you don't conform to this teaching, there are some, there's some kind of sanction. Um, but there is no sanction attached anywhere. Kevin, uh, Kevin and Gavin, I'd like to sort of push this out because I've made an argument that you've both found silly that the tipping point has been reached and that uh, the far far liberal, the tide will, is now gradually coming back. We've had two recent things that uh, on the periphery, one in Scotland and one in Wales. In uh, Wales, we have the new Bishop of Monmouth, uh, Cherry Van. She was a priest of the Church of England. And within the Church of England, she was known as a partnered woman priest, a lesbian priest. Uh, she's elected uh, in Monmouth, and the church in Wales goes absolutely out of its way to have no comment whatsoever on the sexuality issue. They don't want to say a word. Whereas in the past, uh, the former primate, uh, Barry Morgan, was pushing that, and we're going to make a statement, and we're going to do this and that. It's, a, it's almost the old Church of England way, well, everybody knows this person is gay, but we're not going to say it out loud. And then up in Scotland, the Dean of Glasgow, uh, who is a very, this is the fellow who, uh, what's the the old uh, Prince George, uh, oh, he wishes he were gay or something 
you know, maybe he could be gay one day. I mean, fans, yeah, right, right. Holdsworthy is a, is a nut job. <laughs> He's the one that Gavin can tell us at all about the Quran and the cathedral. He's run for bishop several times, and this time the election fell to the House of Bishops in Scotland, and they just reshuffle the cards, moving somebody from Argyle and the islands down to Glasgow, pipping Kevin Oldsworthy one more time. They're not going to be a, a, a gay activist bishop. So we don't have gay activist bishops in Scotland or in Wales or in the Church of England, but we have quietly uh, tolerated gay bishops in Scotland and England and Wales. For a long time. There's always been nod, nod, wink, wink. You know, there's always been rumor, well, you know, he's he's not only gay, he has a, a secret partner that he keeps in the cathedral. Not in the cathedral, but, you know, there's always been these rumors. And now when it's time to put things to stone, you can't overcome that. You can't. But why you know, aren't but why aren't they trumpeting this and celebrating this and just pushing this I mean, the way the Episcopal Church does? When the fellow was elected in St. Louis, they the, the first line was uh, they had all the adjectives, you know, uh, West Indian, black, uh, gay, partnered man, uh, elected bishop, and such and that's such a big deal. Whereas they don't mention these things now in England, it's because they don't want to talk about it, or because they think they've gone too far, or they're or are they pulling back? Well, I think there are two reasons, um, and and one would be uh, expressed by uh, a, a practical man, and another by a suspicious man. So the suspicious man might say that there are several bishops in the Church of England who are having relationships of a sexual and romantic nature, nature with each other who are not married or in civil partnership, but simply seeing one another. And people, this, the difficulty is this comes quite close to, to, to gossip, except that there are photographs of people in social positions which reinforce them. So it's, it's certainly more than gossip. And in one sense, it's not our business to out these people. Um, but so a suspicious person would say, well, the more you bring this matter to the fore, the more uh, the, everything will have to come out into the open. And there are some people who don't want to come out into the open yet, it seems. A practical person would say, well, there's no need to do this because we're winning. Every single appointment, every step we take is moving towards the inclusion of of gay partnered bishops. So we really don't have to draw attention to ourselves and make a clarion call of it because it's just proceeding along at an incrementally effective level. Why? Why? frighten the horses why stir up the vocal opponents when we don't need to we're get, we're getting exactly where we want to be step by step discreetly but they didn't get that with this bishop's pastoral doc but with this bishop's theological document on civil partnerships well the suspicious person would say they were not ready to do it there's a timing is everything in, 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 in both in terms of the holy spirit in real discernment but also in terms of political movements and my my sense is that um, th that would well be would take the view that this is not the time to make the leap. I think there will be a time. Uh, I think the the gap between, as Kevin said earlier on, preaching and pastoring will grow so wide that at some point it will become unsustainable. And they'll make the leap when they think they can win most most completely. But I don't think they've got to that point yet. I think there's also in politics there's a pendulum here in American politics. We go from liberal to conservative, nice and slow, over half a generation. The Reaganites, the Clintonites, the Bushites, the Obamanites, the Trumpites. I mean, this, you know, we have this little pendulum that goes back and forth. And it's never, nobody is ever in control because the pendulum will move again to the left and then the right. And we see that also in politics within the church. They're always testing how far they can go. Here in America, we're testing abortion until birth. Well, that's freaking out a lot of moderates. A lot of people in their 40s, 50s, and 60s who really weren't that interested in abortion politics are now saying, wait a minute. You mean I can abort a child when I can see them pressing out against the womb with fingertips and stuff like that when they're they're moving around and they have a heart beating well it's kind of always been the law that they could do that they're just now making it a proclamation 
And that's freaking people out. Now that pendulum has gone just a little too far left and starting to come back. And people are waking up and saying, no, we're not going to have abortion on demand until birth. We need to stop. What the heck's been going on? Well, you've been hidden because that pendulum never got that far left. It's the same within church politics. People say, you know, when the church is attacked to the part that they finally, their ears perk up, they get involved and say, no, we're not going to allow that in our church. The, you know, and these are the moderate voices, not the conservatives, you know, standing up. They're, they're finally saying, oh, that's just a little too far. That's just a, that's a step too far. And so the liberals will stop doing what they're doing a little, let the, the dust settle, let the pendulum go back, come back, and hope comes back for a bigger swing next time. And that's just the nature of politics and church politics. You know, you, you've lost the battle today, but th tomorrow will come. In Kevin's opinion. Part of the battle here in the United States, I think, is also racial. Uh, the majority of, I think there was a study, there's an article in the news this past week that some 80% of uh, abortion clinics are located in minority majority neighborhoods. That even though black women are approximately 15% of the population, they're 30 to 40% of those performing abortions. Abortion is not uh, the near, I mean, here I am in rural Florida. The abortion clinics, you have to go down to Tampa or Orlando or Miami. You, there aren't, you can't get an abortion in this county. Uh, and, 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 but what I'm saying is that the, Abortion is not on the radar of many people uh, around here because it is a phenomenon that doesn't occur within a particular segment of the population with any great frequency. You're not going to find abortion clinics in the senior population of Florida or the conservative populations of Florida. The, the abortion mills and uh, Planned Parenthoods are all over here in the Northeast, and it's I would say Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry is the last stronghold of racism in the West. Uh, clearly, you know, it's a nine to 10 racial uh, mix up uh, of blacks over whites that are being aborted. And, and one of the phenomena in the right to life movement that has been, I think, rising the recent, in the past decades is the place of the black church being uh, getting stronger and stronger about abortion mm -hmm. of denouncing it and this is basically creating cracks within the traditional political coalitions of black of african americans who are m mostly socially conservative voting for progressive policy makers who do not honor or or uh share their worldviews and so part of what we're seeing uh you know donald trump in florida won a higher proportion of the black vote than any presidential candidate i think going back to reconstruction and i i don't want to get into politics too deeply but i think we're going to see trump at this this next election he'll get 30 percent 40 percent of the black vote in florida if I were running Trump's campaign for re-election. I'd be very pleased with what's happening. I would be pleased that he's being impeached. I mean, that is really bringing to the forefront um, all the silly arguments. Is this guy a wonderful vessel? No, he's as broken as they come. However, this broken vessel is easily going to walk away with uh, a landslide election, uh, not because I'm voting for him, but because... He's being attacked viciously by uh, Democrats without a cause. He's uh, doing the right, he's, he's uh, tooting the right horns and uh, shaking the right hands and kissing the right babies at the right time. He will be reelected without one ounce of media support and probably 95 to 96% uh, of the stories in media are anti-Trump not neutral, but anti-Trump. And he's gonna walk away at the election and nobody's gonna figure out why. You know, the media's gonna be dumbfounded. How did this happen again? Why don't, you know, don't people see how bad we, he is? We report how bad he is. I, I do need our audience to understand that Roe v. Wade 
will probably never be overturned. It will be changed. And at some point in the future, hopefully within my lifetime, you're going to see Roe v. Wade not uh, be about state states' rights anymore. So places like Georgia can refuse abortion, uh, Florida, other places. But places like New York here, uh, California, the more liberal and progressive states, will have abortion tourism. Fly here to uh, uh, New York City. We'll give you a tour of the Statue of Liberty, and you can get your abortion. Uh, it, it's going to be part of the makeup of the human race for at least another two or three generations. I'm sad to report that. Uh, I'm waiting for that pendulum to turn all the way to people to wake up and understand that uh, what science says about when life starts is true. It does start at conception. That's life. Sorry. You know, life scientists confirm it, but politicians, they got something else going on. And they're really... When I'm in D.C. for these things, I can I can feel the evil. You know, I, I just feel that the spiritual oppression for for uh, what we're fighting against here. Gavin, you have it over there, too, in yeah. Europe. Are you ever going to see uh, uh, abortion in there? <clears throat> there is a one of the leaders, one of the women who wants to become leader of the Labour Party as a Catholic. Uh, Rebecca Long Bailey and she got into trouble because she was asked about her views on abortion and there was a clash essentially between her Catholic faith and her political aspirations and she did her very best to to cover them up but essentially she had to choose abortion over her faith and uh, I thought that was really very sad certainly in Europe only the Catholics are the only people uh, that that I can see who are making any kind of stand at all against against this this dreadful industry didn't uh what was it tip the sdp leader tim uh farnan fannin uh, remember that farnan uh, uh he actually chose his faith over his uh political leadership uh well he kind of i, I mean bless him he did him. uh i don't know <laughs> yeah. to... um there are a number of people who found it very difficult the moment their catholic their, their christian faith has come into the uh, area so he was an evangelical and a brave and good one but they asked him questions about gay marriage and he wasn't quite ready for them and he stumbled and you can't afford to stumble uh so they shot him uh, met politically and uh that was the end of that the, uh, the the one person who survived is sorry george oh, isn't he one of the handful of uh liberals still in parliament he survived didn't he the election I don't think so. I think he did. Did, did he? Yeah. No, has he gone completely? Uh, well, uh, but interestingly enough, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who they've been trying to attack about abortion all the time, wonderfully says, um, this is simply the faith of the church. Don't ask me about it. I simply take the church's view, and the church teaches this. Go, go, and, argue with, go and argue with the Pope. It's a great line, and it, the, the secular commentariat haven't yet found a way of bringing him down because... because uh, of his because of the beliefs and the stand of the church but i must say it's always very refreshing when you hear him say this is the faith of my church and i adhere to it don't blame me blame the church and that point the, the the attempt to trap him stops all right so i'm going back to comments probably three or four weeks ago uh maybe five weeks who knows but when you announced that you're going to go and uh convert to the roman catholic church uh, somebody commented on, well, why not the Anglican Ordinariate? Why aren't you uh, taking something that uh, Rome is offering as a, a, a get-out-of-jail-free card uh, and come over to uh, the Roman Catholic Church that way? Why are you going out of your way to uh, lose your orders and become a normal uh, layperson uh, like Kevin? And why would you do something like that when Rome offers you a way to get in uh, to the... Uh, the the party without doing uh, all that back rolling and I thought you could be a good chance for you to answer that question well it's a very interesting question um, the, the bottom line is uh, we we do what we think the Holy Spirit is asking us to do we are people under obedience and this is not a matter of, of choosing your your favorite flavor denomination um, or or the most advantageous platform at the time um, I accepted responsibility to try and defend orthodox Anglicanism and as time went by 
it became clear to me that that I was going to fail very badly. It was it it was impossible for two reasons: the, the people I was trying to help and and the system itself both militated against it. So then the question came: Well, do I waste my life doing this? I mean, is it is it enough to go down as the captain on the bridge of the Titanic, a small town? And um, and a number of people approached me and said, "We we'd like to have you on board." And that included the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, which I found very appealing because. Uh, I think naturally I would find you gotta grow a little longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna work on that. <laughs> I've, I've, I've loved, I've loved and read orthodoxy for a very long time. But as I prayed about it, I didn't have any sense the Lord was saying, "Do this." It was a nice idea I liked, but that's not the same as a vocation. I went to see the ordinary at four, four years ago. It was a nice idea I liked. It didn't seem to me it was a vocation. The thing that changed it was a conversation with my local. Catholic bishop who said, we need you here on the ground in our in my diocese. Come come and help us. Do what you're doing for the Anglicans, but they don't really want you and it isn't going to work. We do want you and it is going to work. So when were you thinking of coming over? And I said rather jocularly, well, like Constantine, I rather thought my deathbed might be a good time. Uh, and he said, well, we, we'd like you before that. And as I thought about it, um, I just had a very strong sense that the Holy Spirit was saying, this is it. This is what you're supposed to do. Uh, it's not particularly easy because it involves the experience of letting go of one trapeze before the other trapeze has appeared. So I'm in a kind of uh, limbo. Um, I suppose the one satisfaction I had was a number of people had said, um, after I accepted the invitation of the splendid Christian Episcopal Church, to be a bishop with them. A number of people have said, well, he's done this because he's interested in the status and the power. Uh, it wasn't true. <laughs> so one small consolation was that by letting go of everything, I, I, I hoped I'd showed that my earlier position had been a choice of integrity rather than of um, something lower than that. But the, the, the short answer is, it seemed to me as clear as daylight that the Lord wanted me to do this. So so there you are, you, you do what you're told to do. George, uh, you and I have heard wonderful stories about the Anglican Ordinariate over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and basically, as best I can tell, it's where they send the unfriendly Roman Catholic bureaucrats uh, to welcome in the Anglicans. Well, there are three Ordinariates. Mm -hmm. North America, UK, England, and Australia. And they're all very, very different. They have very different complexions and tones. And so my experience is of the US version. And so what I say may not apply to the UK. Uh, the US version um, has not been the success that some had hoped. And part of it is that it, it is the cultural shift has been a little too much. You've had some Episcopal clergy who've become members of the Anglican Ordinariate, and they've spent 30 years complaining out loud about how rotten the Episcopal Church is. Well, now they're in the Catholic Church, and they're doing the same thing, but they're saying how rotten Francis is, and they're getting hammered. Now, in the past, getting hammered in the Episcopal Church meant, oh, your mail wasn't returned, or your bishop isn't going to show up for five years, or you're just going to be snubbed. Well, in the Catholic Church, it means you're suspended and you can't work and you don't get paid and you don't have a place to live. So the some people, not all, they're happy members of the Ordinariate, some people have discovered that the Anglican flavor uh, of liturgy is all that they're bringing over, not the Anglican flavor of independence and uh, lack of clerical obedience. So for some people, that's problematic, and it's not worked out for them. Others, it's been wonderful. All right, I think we've covered all the news. Let me double check here, in case we missed I'd just something. like to say, George, I think, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good summary indeed. And um, uh, it, it's certainly true that the, the, the discipline and the obedience and the coherence required by the Catholic Church are a shock to some Anglicans who um, who underestimated the culture that they were uh, they were they were get, getting into? I think I should also say that there's no that that by going in through the diocese, there's no guarantee 
that that I will be given orders back. Uh, it's um, because Rome decides. So my my bishop has to has asked permission, uh, and Rome will will tell him whether or not they think my episcopal orders are valid. There's an outside chance they might be, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, or whether he may reordain me as a Catholic priest. Uh, it, it's a strong possibility, but you can't count on it. So it's a, so again, it's a, it's a different route from the ordinariat. They make no guarantees either, but there's more likelihood once they accept you that you'll, you'll find a route in. One of the things, I, if, if I may just jump in, one of the things I said at the very beginning of this ordinary, when Benedict began it, um, there was a, I knew uh, many of the uh, members of the traditional Anglican clergy's bishops hierarchy who were hoping to go over and none of them uh, were met. They were treated badly in the process. Now you could say that they deserved it and all this and that. However, the, the, uh, if you become a Catholic because you're mad at the Anglican world, those fellows have had a miserable time. But, yeah, if you believe in, but if you believe in the truth claims of Catholicism, then it's the best thing that you could ever do. So for those who, so, you know, Gavin believes in the truth claims. Therefore, yes, I, I think it's wonderful that he has found a way that he can live with integrity in his Christian walk and witness. If he were and I would, because he's mad at the Church of England, I think that's the dumbest thing you could do, but it's not. And I've discovered that I would rather be a layman in the Roman Catholic Church than a bishop in the Anglican Church. And I don't mean by that any criticism. Some people I I insist on hearing this as my team's better than yours. But but it's nothing to do with teams and it's nothing to do with people at all. Uh, it's everything to do with finding more of Jesus. Um, and so how can you, if you find more of Jesus down one ecclesial route, um, it shouldn't be interpreted as being critical of other people or other systems. You've just found more of Jesus. It's a truly wonderful thing. Um, and, I'm, and, and I'm hugely grateful. It should be noted there are far more Roman Catholics who find more of Jesus in the Anglican or Lutheran or other. I mean, uh, it's not an all or one denomination old thing where you find more of Jesus. I See, do. At this point, Robin, you, at this point you, you tempt me no longer yep, to be so. reasonable, and I'd be very happy to argue that. <laughs> no, well, hold on. Uh, I am looking forward to the day where uh, Rome does offer you your orders, and we get to have the headline on Anglican on, uh, Inc. where it says, a Chaplain of the Queen had valid Roman orders. That would be wonderful news for... Uh, I don't know if that's the... I think we're <laughs> combining some terms there that may... I might be. be. Well, I told we? you it's casual unscripted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's chaplain to the Queen's Anglican orders were valid. Were valid, yeah. I'm sorry. Chaplain that's what, that, to the Queen's well, Roman no. orders... That he doesn't have Roman. Right, yeah, but his, his Anglican Actually, orders are valid. What it will really be is chaplain to the queen is doomed by apostolic curi, but his Episcopal orders under an American Anglican denominational group have been discovered to be valid. That, That's that too long for a headline. That, you got to shorten Dutch, that up. Go back Dutch, to my original. <laughs> it's what they call the Dutch touch. In, Dutch uh, touch. <laughs> the old Catholic, uh, old Catholic uh, DNA uh, will save the day. No. Um, let's uh, cut this where we're at to get let people get uh, it's Saturday it's it's almost spring I'm sure like Gavin your wife has given you stuff to do so don't watch unscripted all day just click us off when we're done uh, go to the comments add your comments uh, if I'd you just talk like to say Kevin I'm sure although I have been given a few gardening duties I really am here to deal with a huge backlog of email and a whole oh, of internet because okay. <laughs> <laughs> here I, I, I'm going to show people the pictures you sent me of what you were doing today <laughs> he's got piles he has to take care of uh, Gavin, because... Gavin, Kevin come over here this afternoon bring your shovel I've got two few Funerals and uh, <laughs> the sexton, he's getting old. If I... old. <laughs> <sighs> this is as casual as we get, I hope. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. And uh, as the Normandy sun goes down and my face descends into gloom, <laughs> I'm still Gavin Ashenden. And you've been listening to Anglican Unscripted, episode 569, on the 21st of January 2020. God bless you.